Last night, I spoke about uh, the factor of wisdom, which is the determined part of the mind. The, the, sorry, the determined part of vipassana. Because without this wisdom, without this penetrative factor of the mind, the mind does not turn into vipassana. You can stay mindful, but it does not turn into vipassana. And yesterday I showed you a number of examples. What are a yogi who is just doing mindfulness and which other yogis are doing vipassana? We draw it as clear as possible for you. So I mentioned about the intentions. One of the aspects of exercising the development of the mind of this particular wisdom is to make the effort to note the intentions. Intention is not just only the beginning of the walking, but also you extend out to things and every other thing that you are doing. For example, when you want to change your posture, from walking, from standing into walking, you notice the intention. From your lying down, you want to get up, you notice the intentions. From, uh, from sometimes you can notice some minor intentions that you want to wash uh, your cup, for example. You want to take your cup. Then you notice the intentions. As you notice the intentions, what will follow through is the mindfulness will follow through. That you can able to follow through the things, when, uh, the, the phenomena that comes immediately after that. Therefore, in that way, you begin to extend your continuity of the mindfulness. So when you extend the continuity of the mindfulness and you repeat this process again and again throughout the day, then the mind becomes clearer and clearer and the continuity of the mindfulness becomes more stronger. Uh, If you're able to do this way, uh, it takes you a few days for the mind to overcome a lot of your sloth and torpor, a lot of your sleepiness, drowsiness, and also your thinking mind, restless mind. And then, as I mentioned, in the beginning part, it looks quite superficial for a number of yogis. If you are a beginner, it looks superficial. It looks nothing much. But you have to repeat this again and again until the momentum of the mindfulness starts picking up. Because when it starts picking up, you begin to notice the sense, you begin to notice the actual consciousness of the intention that arises and passes away. Or you can, you can feel the intentions that before you want to start walking, for example, you have to note that intention. If the intention doesn't come in, the movement does not take place. So if a yogi able to repeat this way in many, in many occasions throughout the day and day after day, then the yogis will able to understand the nature of the cause and effect, cause, effect, cause, effect in many ways. Yeah. Uh, not just only in the mind that affecting the body, but sometimes also the body affecting the mind. How arising for a sensation in the body, the mind arises, cause, effect. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes even you're able to see the cause and effect within the mind and mind. The mind arises, another mind. Uh, this mind arises, another mind arises. The phenomena of noting this way, uh, if a yogi is precise, careful in his observation, and you will come to notice these type of things. Uh, and that towards the end of the talk, I've mentioned this when you begin to see the cause and effect. Many times, this is also one aspect of non-self. Not something you think about it, but something you actually observe 
and actually notice. A one area of non-self, and this area of non-self, anatta, is still not that deep yet, no? although you begin to see it, but it's a direct observation of anatta, it starts coming in. So therefore, if you were to try all these things that you have read in your books, all these things that you have heard from the talks, you be begin to able to see it for yourself. Uh, you begin to see it for yourself. But it takes time. Sometimes it may not be just in one retreat, you're going to get it. Sometimes you've got to go for a few retreats before you can see something like this. Uh, now, understanding this way, yeah, later part I will talk about the impact and how all these things, when it, you can translate it back to your everyday life. Although when we practice here, it's not for the sake of everyday life. The, the practice here is for the sake of getting out of cycle of birth and rebirth. Sometimes yogis tend to come in into a retreat no? with the wrong understanding, with the wrong purpose. They come in for a meditation retreat so that when they go back, they want to have a better life, easier life, more happier life. Then you may ask, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? At least, you know, long like Jason Metanamia, doing him song song ho ho lo. Uh, go back, you feel good, you feel nice, then you come back again. But if you come with this attitude now, then you will not strive further. Because your purpose, your purpose of developing vipassana is for the worldly purpose. It's not for the purpose of getting out of cycle of birth and rebirth. I've mentioned this during in the mindfulness that time. Before we talk about mindfulness, I spoke about the purpose that we come here for meditation. This is where you begin to understand your purpose more clearly. The intention, the purpose, all the same meaning. When you begin to happen to do things in your life, you begin to know that you're much, much more clearer what you want to do, for what reason you want to do. Yeah. You become more clearer. But before we talk about these things, become more clearer, we'll, we'll continue that short while later. Yeah. Because it's got to tie in with another topic of, of this part of wisdom in order to see things more clearly. So, Understanding of this purpose, noticing this intention, noticing the wish of what you want to do, and so on. This one in the Pali, they call it Sataka Sampajanya. S A T T H A K A. Sampajanya, clear comprehension. Yeah? Understanding this way when you put it in all the practice. Yeah. Now, the second part of this wisdom. Yeah. The second part of this wisdom, the Pali word is Sapaya Sampajanya, S A P P A Y A. Sapaya Sampajanya. Clear comprehension of benefit, beneficial clear comprehension. Beneficial here comprehension here is that a yogi right now, must do certain consideration whether an action that you are doing or a speech that you are doing or a thought that you are doing, the three doors, eh? action, body action, verbal, and thoughts. Before you act on this thing, this three thing, you have to consider whether this action that you're going to do afterwards Will it be beneficial to you or is it not beneficial to you? It has a very deep impact because in our everyday life, a lot of times we don't consider these things. 
Yeah? We don't consider these things. Therefore, the next thing will creep in, will quietly come in, is your defilements. But you do not know it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by this benefit? What is beneficial? What is not beneficial to you? Yeah. Now as a yogi, for example, we take a simple example. Yeah. We take a simple example. That day I mentioned, uh, when as a yogi, as a yogi, as a meditator, when you want to do a make, go and make a drink in the afternoon, as I said, you don't make the drinks anytime as you like. There are certain, certain times that you should go, other times you should give up. Why is that so? Why is it that this small little thing is important for a meditator? Whereas when you're outside there, you don't consider all, thing, all these things. You want to drink, you want to make coffee, you just go and make coffee. You want to go here, you just go there. You don't consider the next step. But for a yogi, it's a different ball game. A yogi, even you want to make a drink, you have to consider necessary or not necessary. Even this small little thing. Because when you begin to ask yourself, now you are, let's say for example, you are doing your right step, left step, lifting, pushing, dropping, and then ju kya ju sian, you know? Nothing else to see, you know, the same old thing, repeating, repeating, and repeating, and repeating. And then, hey, go and make a drink, you know. Your mind starts talking, you know? go and make a drink. You know? What for? Maybe take a break, and then come back again. You know? Okay, ma, nobody see you. Uh? And then you slowly, you, know? you follow your heart to go. And then you make a drink, 10 minutes later, Come gone already, huh? Then you continue again, uh, lifting, pushing, dropping. Do you see the effect right now? This is, this is exactly right now, is your desire is talking. But you don't see it. Because this is your everyday habit. You don't, you, your, your everyday habit is all dictated by this greed, by this like and dislike, and you just go on and you flow together with it. You flow with it. You don't even know that the whole thing is there. So therefore, as I said, Vipassana meditator, your action has to be noted. Your action has to be noted. Your actions, what you're going to do has to be noted. Say, for example, uh, since yesterday you, you read about, uh, you, you, you heard about intentions, uh, then after that, you're lifting, pushing, dropping, lifting, pushing, dropping. And then just because you noticed the intention yesterday or today, then you said, okay, intention to go and make a drink. Oh, intention, uh, pandai already. Uh. So you intend. Uh, not right. <laughs> because not all the intention comes in with wholesome mental state. Intention can be unwholesome. It can comes with desire. It can comes with anger. It can come with dislike. It can comes with delusion. It can come with any other thing. So therefore, therefore, here is where your wisdom and your understanding comes in and override that intention, that wish, that desire that habit. If you don't break it, if you don't break it and you repeat this again and again, then might as well you meditate at home, might as well you stay at home. You're doing the same thing at home. But here, as a yogi, we train our mind to be penetrative, to be clear about our actions. You know, sometimes you dharma talk You'll be hearing, uh, hey, mindful of your actions, uh, mindful of your speech, uh, mindful of this and that. By the time you go back there, you completely forget. You come back to the same old thing all over again. Why? Because you don't put it into practice. 
Even you put it into practice, you cannot able to see the defilements are actually coming up. But for a yogi, it's a different thing. You begin to see the small little thing, small little habits that is actually detecting your flow of your actions. So, while you're walking, while you're walking, 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 and then the intention comes up. You want to make a drink. Or, in the middle of this one, you consider, you want to go even to a toilet. Then you consider, is it really necessary for me to do that? If it's not necessary, override it, continue on the walking. Even going to a toilet, ah, Even a small little thing. Because why? Because sometimes our yogis, they go to the toilet because nobody sees them. They sit down there. Everything just let it go. (sighs) Come back again. They start all over again. It's the same process. Externally, it can be different. But internally is where the desire is pulling all the strings. It's pulling your heart here, pulling there, pulling you to do everything. Uh, uh, here uh, in MBMC here especially the male hall here it take you about 10 steps and uh, you reach your bed already you know you realize that maybe 10 or 20 steps uh. while you are doing walking 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 you just feel oh so tired it's quite it's quite easy for you just to walk in there and lie down and that's it yeah you take about a few steps. If those of you in Pandita Rama, if you've been to Pandita Rama, you're thinking of going back, huh? take you 15, 20 minutes to go back. Huh? By the time you go back, you're already alert. Really. <laughs> so, that, so when it's far away, you don't think about all these things. But when it's near, the condition is in such a way, you tend, because of its condition, is that you tend to do the things that any, any other thing except meditation. Uh, except meditation. You want to lie down, you want to relax, and, to all, and so on, all, all kinds of things. Uh, so this one, you have to consider. Going to the room, going to the toilet, is it really necessary? Most of the time, it is not necessary. But sometimes, it can be really necessary. Because you consider yourself, Oh, now really stomach ache already. Now really stomach ache. Cannot take it anymore. Then might as well go. Yeah. Not like you, yesterday or means since tonight you listen to the Pante says, huh? cannot go. <laughs> then you, <laughs> not like this. <laughs> not like this. Because sometimes yogi tend to hear one part of it. They don't hear the other part of it. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that you have to consider your action. You have to consider your action. Is this beneficial for me or not? Is it proper for me or not? Is it okay for me to do that or not? If it's not okay, then then stay with the meditation, stay with the sitting. If it's okay, if you really need to go, do so. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, some yogis, uh, even in the afternoon, uh, they have like a, a very, sometimes after they walk, they become very weak because of some, some medical problems or whatsoever. Then they need to make a drink during this time. Then they consider, really necessary, necessary, please go. It's not that I'm going to stop you. It's that you have to consider it for yourself. Yeah. So you begin to consider this part. What is really necessary? What is not necessary? Yeah. Think, for example, like verbal speech also. Hmm. Now the speech here, we are so easy for us to open our mouth and talk to another yogi. And nowadays, as I said, it's very easy for us just to take out our mobile phones and just... You know, just go through, scroll through, and surf whatever the net is on our little screen over there uh, while we are in the retreat. 
So these actions, this, even these verbal actions, you have to consider. Is it necessary for me to go down and talk to another yogi? Uh, sometimes yogis, you know, <clears throat> they do not know each other, you know, since because you are coming from different parts of the country, maybe different parts of the world. <clears throat> they come in here, you know what they do? You know the basin here? It's like two or three basins together, you know. Uh, after they do the laundry, do, do, do. Hey, where are you from? Uh? <laughs> uh, how long have you been staying here? <laughs> Every day raining, huh? Oh, yeah, this one also cannot get dry. Uh, start already, you know. Then start already, then start already. And then after that, you walk to each other, you smile and smile and see you like that. And then that's it. You begin to start talking and talking and then talking. And then after that, you get the number. After that, oh, next time I'm going to visit you. Uh, let's get already, you know. Yeah. There are many things in the yogis, what they do, because they don't really consider whether these things is really beneficial to them or not. They just do and do and do, and out of habit, they just do. They don't consider. So a yogi must learn to consider, even if you want to open up our mouth, because it's so easy. It's so easy sometimes, uh, we open up our mouth without considering. A lot of times, in outside there, we hurt a lot of people. We slice upon other, others with our, our tongue. Yeah? So you've got to be careful. Yeah? You've got to be careful because if you learn this way, when you come into this retreat, you make an effort. You make an effort to notice these things. Next time you begin to see your own habit. Your own habit. And then only when you can able to see your own habit, you can actually able to change yourself. If not, if not when? If not, how? Even if you hear the next 10 Dhamma talks also about these things, you go back, you react the same thing all over again. Why? Because you cannot see the inner subtle type of defilements. So this type of things, a yogi must learn to consider. You learn to consider yeah? whether this is wholesome for you to do whether it is beneficial for you to do whether it is purposeful whether it is good for you to do or not good for you to do if it's unwholesome then we override the whole thing then we stay on with what is wholesome hmm? yeah. also when it comes into the beneficial part of the meditation also there are also like what is good and what is better. Not just only what is good and what is bad, yeah, but what is good and what is better also. As a yogi, you must consider something which is beneficial to you. Yeah? Say for example, you come here and you meditate, but every now and then, you want to go to the body tree there and you go and you go round and round, three rounds, you know, three rounds, and then come gone already, and then you come up and meditate. Or you want to, you want to take uh, the, the, the flowers, for example, the puja, you know, puja. For one hour, maybe you walk there, the puja. Go round, go round. Not to say that this is an unwholesome act, but is it necessary for a yogi? This is still wholesome. It's better than you, if considered for a person, if you're a, if you're a non-yogi, then this is something wholesome. To, to able to do some puja, to able to do... The mind is calm, the mind is having confidence to the Buddha. Yes, this is wholesome compared when you are out there. But when you are here, when you are here, doing the meditation part, the merits, the, 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 the benefit of it is even more stronger than doing all this puja and all this chanting. Yeah? Not to say that you cannot. Say, for example, there are some people who come to a, to, a, to a monastery, to a temple and all that, and they want to do a lot of service work. 
Uh, a lot to do. They want to sweep around. They want to clean here, clean there. They want to serve. They want to do the cooking and so on. Uh, all these things. For for example, you, a lot of you comes here to volunteer to help. Uh, I mean, this is wonderful. This is sadhu to you. But this is not an area for a yogi to do. Because these things are not necessary for a yogi to do. If you do these things, you can sweep and so on. Although it's wholesome, but after that, when you go and meditate, uh, oh, uh, the mind, uh, chi chi cha cha, chi chi cha cha, chi chi cha cha. A restless mind uh, comes in. And the mind is not calm. You think you're going to sweep your floor? Sweeping, sweeping, man. This is a big crown. You know? You're not going to like sweeping very slowly. You're going, to, you're going to do it very fast if you are doing all this service over here. So, Therefore, as a yogi, all these unnecessary things, we keep it all aside. Even chanting also, actually. Mm. Even a lot of chanting, I mean. If a short chanting, is, it does not really af- affect the yogi. Sometimes it's good to boost up the mind, yes, but short enough. Too long a chanting, say, say for example, some people do chanting a lot in the home. Yeah, they want to. Uh, they want to, uh, uh, to 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 bring it into their while they are meditating also. So every day they do one hour, two hours of chanting. Uh, the professional chanter. Uh, better than the monks. Uh, they can from page one to page hundred. They can all chant without looking at a book. Um, I mean, this is wonderful. This is a wonderful, beneficial aspect of it. But as a yogi, when you come in, you've got to put it all aside. Then you've got to put it all aside. The whole purpose as a yogi, you do the job as a yogi. And all other small but necessary things for you to stay alive in the, in the retreat. Yeah? To carry on your life in the retreat. Other than that, it's not necessary. In fact, uh, even the chanting and the meta chanting also, you know, sometimes you all do at night in other places or here or so. Even that chanting for a long term yogi uh, is not good. For a short term yogi, maybe you come in for a short while, you meditate, you go back, you feel good, okay. But for a long term yogi, even that chanting, because it's melodious enough. When you med- meditate, that melody will start coming in longer and longer instead of your rising and falling. And then how come it cannot stop? How come it cannot stop? Because it's nice. It's melodious. Hmm? Even these small things, if you don't consider it, it affects the yogi. At least perhaps a short while. Uh, at least a short while. But it still breaks your concentration, it breaks your mindfulness. Uh, all these small, small things you have to consider. Uh, so, so, next time when you do an action here, uh, when you want to do, uh, you want to, when you do want to go something, you want to go this one, consider whether that intention that you want to do, that wish that you want to do, that purpose, action that you want to do, whether it's speech, action, thought, if you, any, you want to do, take note of it. Even the thought also the same thing. You have to consider, is this thinking is proper or not proper for me? Sometimes our mind uh, can be a bit nasty. Not a bit, uh, sorry. A lot nasty. <laughs> not a bit. Terrible. I smile at you. Uh, yeah. But the mind is terrible. Uh, so if you have this habit, you've got to be very careful. Because even the mind is even more subtle and not even clear. So next time, while you are here, you want to do something, you want to think of something, you take note. Is those thoughts beneficial for me or not? If it's not beneficial to me, put it all aside. Uh, Put it all aside. Just pay attention to the sensation, to the phenomena of what is happening in the present moment. Other than that, keep it all aside. Now if you're able to do it in this way, if over the time 
you start with the retreat uh, in this way. You consider whether the action is suitable or not suitable and so on. Uh. In the long term, your habit, a very good habit of a meditator will start coming in. That habit comes in as an inner virtue, an inner morality, sila. This is not something that a teacher will tell you, hey, don't talk, huh? don't go and go to your room, huh? don't go and drink here, drink there. It is in the beginning part, the teacher will tell you, but later part, as you meditate, it comes out from your own, from your inner heart from the inner morality that you comes up, you know that this is not the time for me, I don't do it. This is not the time for me to go to the room, I don't do it. I stay with the meditation. Walk, sit, walk, sit, walk, sit. And then all these defilements tempting you to go to the toilet, to do this, to do that, all these defilements slowly and slowly, it abandons. So that's why you can see sometimes uh, how come this yogi can just walk up and down, up and down, up and down, sitting and not just whole day do like that. How come I cannot do that? Because all these things, they over time they develop, the yogis develop those type of skills, those types of clarity of the mind. So therefore, when you they develop this clarity of the mind, all these unnecessary things, they give it all aside, then therefore, the continuity of mindfulness has a better chance to arise. It keeps on repeating because you stay with the walking meditation. You do the sitting until it finishes. You don't get up halfway to do this and do that. Stay with the whole process. Yeah. That's why a lot of times uh, when, we, when it comes to the walking meditation, uh, People do not, yogis do not have that discipline. Many yogis, I mean, when, when it comes to other places and so on, huh? when I look at them in doing in walking meditation, this is exactly just now what I've said. They walk, walk, walk. After that, they go to the balcony or go to the window, they stretch out themselves. And then after that, they come back again, walk, 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 go out and, and do a lot of times, although I could able to see it, uh, but that time also I was a yogi. Uh, I don't go and bother, you know, whatever they want to do. You cannot be telling them and so on. We are not a teacher there. But we already know how the mind and how the heart is actually, actually um, are running right now. The process is going through right now. Uh, so be careful. Uh, if you are careful of the small little actions that you do, you find it that next time when you able to meditate this retreat, uh, it cuts, it goes on even more smoother. It's so smooth in the sense that uh, the temptation it doesn't come in anymore or doesn't come in that much. It then suddenly you do the walking, even the thoughts of going to make a drink, it doesn't come in because the sila already, already kind of like cut it off. Uh, the, the morality is really cut it off of all these unnecessary things. Is it really ne necessary to talk? The sila has already cut it off from internal, not like uh, hearing, uh, remembering what the teacher said, but it's actually coming out from your own. So when it comes in out from your own, then it becomes a very beautiful attitude of the mind. Then those things you can bring out everywhere in your life. Yeah? Now, if you're able to do these things, huh? if you're able to consider the benefit, the purpose, what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, what is good and what is better, you know, then it's going to be very helpful in your life. Yeah. Say, for example, huh? you, know, you know, sometimes huh, we, we all, you know, I chaka lao lao, you know. Uh, you want to grow old. You thought that you can grow able to grow old. You want to be happy. You want to be healthy. Isn't it? You want to you don't want to fall into sickness and so on. Yeah. So what do we do? 
We, we exercise, we take supplements, we take good food, we take organic food, whatever, you know, so that you want to keep yourself alive. Why you want to keep yourself alive? What's the purpose you want to keep yourself alive? You want to be happy. So, now, especially those who are already 60, 70, huh? Bukang Juliao, eh, huh? Why you want to keep yourself alive? Hmm? What's the next one you want to do? Ki kai kai, yo. Ki tour. So that the legs can still walk, you know. Then next walk, huh? Then I can book the next tour. Then after that, I come back from Japan, I want to go to Europe. Yeah. So I exercise. For what reason? So that I can be happy. Yeah. You see, you keep your health healthy. The purpose, again here, you're looking about the purpose, the intent, and whether it's beneficial to you or not. Now, the purpose here, you want to be healthy. You want to be happy. Happy, Happiness in what sense? Happiness because it's all a worldly happiness. A worldly happiness. Uh, Let's say for a monk who is striving or a nun who is striving, they keep themselves healthy too. For what purpose? Because when they keep themselves healthy, then they can able to do the striving, which is more beneficial than just a worldly happiness. Because the worldly happiness, it comes in with greed. Uh, it comes in with greed. Well, whether you like it or not, whether you can able to understand it or not, that is another thing. Uh, so, so, therefore, a purpose for us to be healthy, for example, is a purpose. But then we also consider whether this thing is what type of benefit is going to give us. Is it spiritual benefit or is it a worldly benefit? Then you can choose for yourself. We can choose for ourselves. Now sometimes, for example, people come to a temple. They come and do service. They, they help in the kitchen, they help in the, in the, in the, you know, the cleaning up and so on. Yeah. For what purpose they come in? Say, for example, they say, I am coming in for, for, you know, to accumulate good merits, wholesome merits and so on. That is still wholesome, not to say unwholesome, you know. But long enough, sometimes they're in the, in the temple, they become possessive of the temple, as if they're young, as if they become that, they thought that that place is theirs already. So they become like little Napoleon inside there, you know. You <laughs> You know, when, when I was young, I was really helping out in this meditation center. Yeah. And then while the monks are eating, uh, sometimes, I, uh, sometimes I come in to, to help, to, 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 to clean up the tables, and, and you know, you, you bring from the food from the monk's table to the, to the kitchen table there. Many years ago, during that time, I was just a teenager, you know. These people, uh, one or two people, huh? One or two people, after you take the food, especially the fruits, you cannot directly go to the kitchen table. You have to bypass, uh, go to another table and leave the thing there for that somebody to take all the fruits, keep it first, then only you can bring it to the kitchen table. If you don't do that, you can get scolding. <laughs> Those days... <laughs> Nowadays, they don't have that much anymore. Huh? <laughs> uh, so, here is the greed. They come here, they become very possessive of things, of the places. They forget about the whole purpose they come here. When they don't re-examine their whole intention of why you come into doing good, then your defilements will start to creep into you. You become possessive, you become authoritative. You become, you become like jealous to other people. Say, for example, say for example, uh, one lady go and talk to the to the monk for a longer period of time. Then the other one look at it. Ah, you are not kongkaneku, 
jealousy lah, you know. How can I talk so long? You know, I feel not sad. This is what we call you begin to possess in all these things. Because why? You can't see the defilements actually creeping in. The more that we are able to meditate, if we meditate it proper, properly, we begin to always stay with our intention, the purpose that we come here to meditate or come here to serve, our original intention, not cover up by our power, by our standing in the bed, just because that we come here for 20 years or 30 years and so on. If you think that that way, I'm more 20 years, i got more experience than you, then your conceit is already coming in. Huh? These things happening in everywhere. Everywhere. Because we are all human beings. We have all these defilements. But as a yogi, we begin to learn to see these things. We begin to feel these things is happening in us by understanding of our intention, by understanding of our, our purpose and our uh, intention, purpose. Then we notice whether it's what are the benefit. Then it will help us to guide us in our path of Dharma much more straight, much more clearer from all the challenges. If we don't do that, we will repeat the same mistake all over again. And next life when you come back, let's say you're back, back as a human being, you come back with the same attitude. Yeah? This is how the defilements work. Yeah. So, therefore, take note of your defilements. If you begin to take note of your defilements, your intentions and your whether this is benefit or not, you begin to go into a more subtle aspect of the wholesomeness and unwholesomeness. You begin to see your jealousy arises. When you feel your jealousy arises, you stop your words, you stop your mouth. You feel that the, you feel that the, the actions coming up not necessary for us to do then there's a hold back. Then if you find that there is a wholesome thing for us to do, then that time, because the mind, the intention with full force, it will come and do the service and to do the dana and to do the offering or to do the meditation and so on. Because the mind is clear. Together with the intention, together with this wholesome and unwholesome, what is beneficial and what is born beneficial, we begin to see this different aspect Therefore, the mind becomes more precise, more sharper. That is the nature of wisdom because the wisdom discerns. It breaks apart what is wholesome, what is unwholesome. What is your purpose, what is not your purpose. What is a wholesome purpose, what is unwholesome purpose. You begin to differentiate these things because the mind can able to differentiate it out, discern it out. Therefore, it's called wisdom clear comprehension. Yeah? So in this way, if you were to try over the time, it would be very helpful to you in your everyday life. Next time, for example, you want to talk outside there, you don't talk with an ulterior motive. You know? You know, talk, talk with ulterior motive, especially your sales or lawyer. Or whatever. <laughs> Nowadays, any 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 profession also is like that. You know, yeah. sometimes even doctors also. You tell them they want to treat you, but they just want to cut you up and get your money. There's nothing inside that. Sometimes, <laughs> uh, unscrupulous practice. You know. Anyway, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that here, if we begin to understand our own intentions, what is beneficial to us, and so on, then we become more straightforward. What is the straightforward in Pali eh? just now? What is the iti piso bako? What's the the, 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 the sangha quality? The quality of a sangha. Straightforwardness. Ujukata. Straightforward. 
that you don't practice this meditation, uh, for example. Straightforwardness here means that you are direct, you are honest, that you don't practice this meditation just because of any other, any other worldly benefits. You, for the purpose of getting out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. Because there are people who come and meditate, monks or nuns or lay people, uh, they come and meditate in order to get their standing in the world or uh, in a position better in life. Why? Because they begin to able to sit in the Dharma chair. Then that's it. There's no more meditation anymore. They feel that, oh, kao leo. The hidong also, you know, very high already. The nose also become very high. The ego is as big as the mountain already. Huh? Wholesome benefit, wholesomeness, but you, you don't see it carefully also. These defilements do come in, just like when you do service or do any other thing also. So when you're able to practice clearly, then the quality of that sangha that you chanted, uju, this is what it means here. Straightforward. Yeah? <clears throat> so these two things, with the intentions and with the, with the uh, intentions and the uh, beneficial, they all both this time come together. So therefore, as a yogi, yeah, your actions, your speech and your thought do consider it before you do any something unnecessary. Yeah? Long enough, you find that you are much more lighter, you are much more easier as a yogi, mm? mentally at least. Mm? So these two things is on the, on the area of wisdom because both discern different areas of the mind. Yeah? <clears throat> the next exercise of wisdom, the next exercise of clear comprehension is on what we call gochara sampajanya. Gochara means a boundary, a boundary of your of the wisdom. Yeah? What do you mean by boundary here? Uh, here, we're going to look into what are the right objects and what are not the right objects for the meditation. In order for us to be able to differentiate these two again, again here is a, a discerning factor of the mind. It breaks down, not it breaks down, it begins to differentiate what object is necessary for me to take up for, for the meditation and what objects are not necessary for me to take up in this meditation. If you cannot differentiate these two, you're going to end up with a lot of problem also because you, most of the time, if a vipassana yogi, if you are not taught into what are the right objects, you will most of the time you will end up with the wrong objects. Hmm? What are the right objects and what are the wrong objects? I wouldn't say wrong. Eh? I wouldn't say it's not suitable. Not suitable for the meditation objects. It may be suitable for other things, other meditation, for example. It may be suitable for other things in life, but it may not be suitable for vipassana. Or if you are doing a samatha meditation, let's say you are doing a, a, a metta meditation, then perhaps other things is not suitable. Yeah? Now take for example, you know, um, what, are the, what are the suitable objects for us to able to take up in this meditation? You are given objects, a walking meditation, sitting meditation, you, know, you feel the sensation, tension, pulling, pushing, dropping and so on. I ask you all to take note of those things. I ask you to take note of the rising, falling, you know. Uh, you take note of the tension arises, biting here, pain here, all these things. Thoughts arises, thinking arises, you're not thinking, thinking, planning, planning. If hearing arises, you're not hearing, 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 hearing. I said, don't go into the story. Although I just brush it off like that, you know. But there's a lot of meaning inside here. 
Uh, tonight is, is where we want to, uh, to, 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 to bring out the meaning even more clearer. Yeah? Yeah. What are the suitable objects for vipassana? Suitable object for vipassana means that you can directly feel it. You can directly notice it. Not by thinking, not by your commentary, not by your judgment. You can able exactly feel it. For example, pain. Right now, painful or not? Maybe after sitting for some hours already, you know, it may be very painful right now. You have to think about it, one man. Or oh, this one pain? Ah? No. Because you can directly feel it, therefore it is the right object for a vipassana. Yeah? Uh, if you can feel the rising and falling of the abdomen, for example, yeah, this is the right object of vipassana. You can feel the certain sensation is happening in the body. A pulling here, for example, a warmness, a, a, a coldness. Then these are directly can be known. Uh, directly can be known. Now, look at what is not the suitable objects. What are not the suitable objects for a vipassana? Very simple is the thinking. But here, the thinking here, what I'm trying to say is that the thinking, when you are inside the content, you are inside the story. Yeah. When you drag you, for, 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 you, know, you go around the world, you go around everywhere, uh, that is when you are not in the right objects. Isn't it? How many rounds in the world have you all gone uh, today? Uh, how many rounds of happiness you thought once upon a time you have? Or how many rounds of sadness that you have gone through all today? Uh, a lot. Just sitting there doing nothing but your mind is everywhere except in the present. Right? This is how difficult to bring the mind into presentness. So we see that even in the meditation, our mind gets dragged into the thoughts. When you get dragged in the thoughts, when you get flow with the thoughts, these are not the suitable object for a vipassana meditation. Yeah? These are not suitable. Because those objects are created by the mind. They are not directly known by a mind, created by the mind. Your thoughts, your thinking, your planning, your future, is all created by the mind. Even you comment, for example, even for example, when we do a rising and falling, you take a note of your rising and falling. Your labeling, although they are helpful, but they are actually also made up by the mind the labeling. But the process you feel is the real object. The sensation that you feel, those are real. But the labeling is mind created, mentally created. So sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, let's say you walk, uh, you walk, right step, left step, right step, left step. Suddenly, your right become left, right, left become right. Yeah? Uh, how, eh, how come like that? Eh, bela, bela, and then you put back right again, left again. <laughs> you know, you have all these things. Again here, sometimes if you forget, don't get too concerned. Uh, or you want to change it back, okay, alright. But don't get, you get too worried about how come, oh, see la, my mind is getting haywire. It's perfectly alright. Yeah. It's perfectly all right. Sometimes it mix up a little bit. Sometimes even you mix up a little bit, this is rising and this is falling. Yeah? So it's perfectly okay. Sometimes you notice that, say, the pain. You notice the pain is getting harder and harder. And you notice this. Or sometimes uh, these yogis, uh, they note this pain, uh, but they are more concerned uh, what word to give it. You know? Is this sawing pain or is this throbbing pain? Uh? Let me think about it first. Huh? Let me think. And then you turn. It's not for you to do like that. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you don't have the actual correct name for it. As long as your mind sees the thing as it is. 
Because the pain, the, 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 the nature of the pain is more important than your words. Your words over here is mentally construct. If you don't use the word, you can use the word pain only, but you pay attention to, to what is happening, then it's correct. Because the mental construction, the mental thoughts, are sometimes, no, sorry, sorry, cannot use the word sometimes. A lot of times, they are very enticing. They are very captivating. If you are a, a especially very studious and, and you like to read and you like to make sure that your, pop, where your, your, your words are all correct, you know, uh, then you're going to have a lot of problem when it comes to this. You want to be very precise your words to connect it. So don't worry about the words too much. Here, the process of labeling, the reason that we ask you to do in the beginning part of the meditation is so that the mind can able to direct the mind towards the actual object that is observing. Not only just observe it, but also to stay with it for a period of time. That's why we use the word, we use the word labeling in order to guide the mind, to guide a very wild mind, in order for it to tame it down, we use the labeling process. It is very helpful. But we should not stick with the labeling all the time. Because if you're a seasoned yogi, if your yogi becomes more seasoned into further and further development, then we have to drop the labeling also. If you use the labeling too much, then that labeling will become a hindrance to your progress. You see? It will be a hindrance for your development because the phenomena changes faster than your words can be created. That time you've got no words. By the time you want to put the words there, the next object has already started. Are you going to think again? Again and again? Then you're going to slow down your whole nature of your development. The process of change in this meditation, as you go deeper, they are much more faster than what you think is just rising and falling, rising and falling, that's all. There are, much, there are a lot of difference inside that. So sometimes when our mind is, for example, a very clear object is changing and so on, we drop the labeling. But sometimes when you are sleepy again, things are not clear and not uh, very sharp. Then you bring in the labeling again. It's perfectly all right. Sometimes yogi thought that, wow, what holy already? Huh? Over oh, twenty years I meditate. I don't even, I don't play labeling anymore. Oh, <laughs> this is all your your your, your thoughts and the labeling is just a tool, necessary tool. If it's not necessary, you put it aside. What is important that you pay attention to the object. So here, you have to differentiate between this labeling and this, this object that you pay attention to. Your thinking process, uh, your, 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 sorry, your, your, your content of your thinking and also how you pay attention to the thinking as a correct object. Now, yesterday or the day before, I ask you, when you pay attention to the thinking, let's say the thinking comes up, I ask you to come out from the thinking. Yeah? To see it as, an, as a just thinking, thinking, planning, planning, planning. Yeah? Because that, those are basic instructions. But what actually I want you to do is this. Let's say you have a lot of thinking right now. You know, the, the thought, thinking, and process is just keep going. So this time, you've got to make an effort to pull yourself out. When you pull yourself out, then whatever content inside there, you may see your parents, you may see your loved ones, you may see this scenery, you may see scenery that you have never seen before, you may see your past memory, you may see a future planning. If you are inside there, it's always connected to you. Oh, this is my mother. Oh, this is my father. Oh, this is my job. Oh, this is my enemy. This is that person. This is doing me. This, I want to do this. When you're inside there, it's all the I is all connected with it. When it's all connected with it, this is where you get more and more and more thinking. The process will keep going and going and when it's not stopped until you realize it that 
this is a thinking process then the whole mind pulls out from it when the mind pulls out from it but a lot of times the thinking still does not stop the thinking still going on so what do you do right now this time we pay attention to the process of the thinking how the thinking changing from one thought to another thought to another thought as if like you're staying out there then you feel that the thoughts just one one thought another thought another thought another thought another thought instead right now the two process that if you are in a in a thinking and when you are out of the thinking when you are in the thinking you are in the wrong object not suitable object when you begin to come out and watch a process of thinking of planning that it becomes a suitable object you see what i mean therefore you need to most of the time if you can try your best to come out from the thinking whatever that you do no matter how the how the thinking is so you know you you how wonderful it is you you thinking about your dana you thinking about sila you think about this monk that monk this nun or that nun or you thinking about your japan trip or whatever trip ah don't go and get caught into it it you, the unwholesome wholesomeness is all inside there once you get caught into it the story will go on and on and on and on and on therefore you are not taking the suitable object some people some yogis they are very uh, scholarly in that sense so even they are, they are scholarly in that sense huh? what they do is that they are not rising and falling not rising and falling ah eh it is a hong as a hoi as a jui as a tao ah you know this is this is earth element or fire element or is this this one is a uh, a water element and so on what element then we start thinking then again you are just going back into a this although the dhamma is there the dhamma is there but you are taking up the wrong dhamma here the not the suitable dhamma your dhamma is supposed to come back and pay attention to the rising and falling and stop all the commentary yeah sometimes it's very enticing for us to think especially when yogis have a lot of phenomena that is changing oh this changing that changing uh, oh is this impermanent uh? is this what the buddha says uh? is this what the bante says uh, that day he spoke about this impermanent that impermanent jati o a si o a now you begin to you begin to think about all these things and then you want to the theory and the experience you want to make it gam gam you know you want to connect the whole thing there this is where you get caught into all the thoughts or all the thinking although it may be a dhamma but it can be very enticing for you to get caught into it so therefore therefore as best as you can whatever commentary that you have whatever thinking that you have whatever opinions judgments and so on that you have as best as possible you keep it aside as much as you can although you will take you will come back you will come back you will learn to accept it see that it is put it aside come back again notice what is right what is suitable to you he will come up again and again because this is the mental habit of ours you just cannot just come to one retreat and that's it you know no but it comes up again and again so you learn to accept them as they are as they come up at the same time you observe them let them go choose the right object which you are supposed to pay attention to yeah. so tomorrow i'll continue more on this aspect of the right objects and the wrong objects are uh, not the suitable objects because these objects have many layers you even go further and further into more refined type until we don't really know uh, which is the right one and which is the wrong one that is where the teacher will start coming in to help you yeah so tomorrow we'll continue on that we'll so we'll stop here for the night no huh? <clears throat>